Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Louise Leong, and I'm the gallery manager of the Mary Porter Cessnon Art Gallery. I'd like to start off the event with our land acknowledgement from UC Santa Cruz. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsin tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Thank you. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm so pleased to introduce uh, our event today. One moment, please. So I'm so pleased to introduce Planetary Indigestion, a year-long series of conversations with the Center for Genomic Astronomy and other expert guests. Today's program marks the first in a series of four online events with on-the-ground experiments and interventions to be announced along the way. The Center is an artist-led think tank that has been examining the biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems through experiments and public art projects since 2010. They are artists in residence invited to our campus by UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute and Open Lab. Thank you, Jennifer Parker, for bringing them to us, uh, which continues their ongoing partnership, bringing interdisciplinary research across the arts and sciences to the public. Uh, the chat will be open throughout the event for you all to ask your questions. Uh, and finally, this event will be recorded and will be available on our Cessnon Gallery YouTube channel later on. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the Center for Genomic Astronomy for them to introduce themselves. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Louise. <laughs> Great introduction. Uh, this is going to be good practice. We have to stay parallel to both show up. So <laughs> that's going to be a challenge on our side, but mostly I'll be invisible. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming tonight. Um, we will share our screen in a second, but you can kind of see our faces <laughs> before then. And um, we're hoping this first event is uh, somewhat conversational. And then as the events go on throughout the year, we'll hopefully have more room for conversation. But uh, tonight it's called About Us because um, we wanted to kind of set the stage and um, give you a sense about what our artistic practice, our, our collective artistic practice for the last 11 years has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll share the screen. And there's three of us here, uh, Zach, Kat, Emma. <laughs> And actually, Camille, who is temporarily working with us, is also in the audience, I saw. <laughs> so. so yeah, tonight's session is called About Us. All three of us will kind of take uh, stabs at talking at different moments. And um, we'll probably interrupt each other a few times, which is a good thing. And I think we like to kind of perform that uh, as we go to show how our studio works and how we sometimes agree and disagree. Um, Yes. So, uh, yeah, planetary indigestion is the name of uh, the that we've given to this artistic residency opportunity. Um, we don't know what that means yet, and we're hoping to figure that out over the next year. Um, and just we'll repeat this at the end, but these are kind of the dates for the other uh, moments uh, that you can uh, join us, and we'll probably have some other activities um, as well and uh, they'll be announced on the gallery website. Good. Uh, so uh, about us. Um, our plan for tonight is to do some quick introductions uh, and then to tell you about some of the ingredients we researched over the last decade. And then right away, we'll uh, after 20 minutes or so, we'll break for Q and A. And hopefully that's like a ask me anything, ask us anything moment. So it doesn't need to be thought through questions. We like to get inspired by what uh, comes up in people's uh, minds early on. So we can direct our comments in the second half when we talk about menus and guests. Um, and then we'll try to address what we think planetary indigestion is or could be. Um, and then we'll break for a second kind of conversational moment. So to simplify it, these are the three themes tonight, ingredients, menus and guests. 
Um, so yeah, we'll uh, introduce ourselves and have a few definitions. All right, so the Center for Genomic Gastronomy, um, we call ourselves an artist-led think tank that examines the biotechnologies uh, and biodiversity of hum human food systems. Uh, and we have several projects which sort of show this. And uh, over the years, we've had to come up with a mission statement, often for funding applications. Uh, but we've, we've tried to stay true to this over the years. Um, and we say that our mission statement is to map food controversies, prototype alternative culinary futures, and imagine a more just, biodiverse, and beautiful food system. Uh, so I guess I'm first in the slides. So my name's uh, Catherine Kramer, or Kat, you can call me. And um, I come from Norway. Um, and this is a previous work of mine before I started working with Zach and Emma, uh, looking at cloud seeding technologies and sort of taking it to its ultimate ridiculous conclusion of trying to make cloud snow ice cream and talking to people about weather modification and climate change. Oh yeah, here's another picture of that. We can just skip that. Uh, yeah, and my name is uh, Zach Denfeld and this is a picture of us at the Victorian Albert Museum um, for one of their late night events many years ago. And um, like, uh, I, I like talking to people. It's something I yeah, enjoy being out there in the world. I'm originally uh, from the US, although uh, none of us have lived there for a good while. So this residency is a nice chance for us to reconnect with what's going on in the States. Um, and Kat is less interested in talking to the public. Um, so that's sometimes how we split the labor that uh, Emma and myself as the chatty Americans uh, talk to everybody. And um, for me, this research began uh, when I was teaching uh, a class on food and politics. So I used to teach at the Shrishti School of Art, Design and Technology in Bengaluru, India. And uh, we did a food and politics class with undergraduates that actually started as a color theory class and then morphed into food and politics. Um, and, and we started um, documenting the um, conversations and protests and resistance to uh, uh, commercializing a genetically modified aubergine or eggplant. Um, and, and that's kind of um, when I started getting interested in how artists could uh, look at yeah, agricultural biodiversity, um, which is what one thing you see on the steps here uh, yeah. at this protest. And uh, also Kat and I have a son who's now four years old, so this picture's a little bit out of date, but of course it puts any theories you have about food uh, to the test when you're actually trying to get another human to eat things that are nutritious and tasty. Uh, and I'm Emma Conley. Uh, I'm also from the United States. I live in Portugal right now. Um, and I met Zach and Kat in 2013. They had already started the practice of genomic astronomy, but um, I was doing a master's in collaborative design at the Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and that's where we met and I've been uh, working with them ever since. And then a lot of our practice um, uh, demands a lot of different kinds of collaboration. So um, this is just a selection of some of the people we've collaborated with over the last 10 years. Uh, and a lot of times it's scientists, uh, chefs, farmers, journalists, biohackers, students. So we just wanted to acknowledge their work and uh, might be something we can pick up on is um, the kinds of collaborations that get formed and how that happens. Emma, so we do, things. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we we do uh, diff different kinds of kind of large scale research projects that end up being disseminated through lots of different um, channels. So our work consists of publications. Sometimes we contribute to other people's publications by um, having a written piece or kind of a, a photo essay. But we also have some of our own books, including a series um, called Food Freaking, which is the Journal of Experiments, Exploits, and Explorations into the Food System. So each issue of Food Freaking looks at the intersection between food technology and open culture. I think Kat will talk about it a little bit more later. Um, we also make exhibitions. 
sometimes we make the whole exhibition or, or are the curators or um, exhibition designers and invite other artists or designers or practitioners to show their work. Um, and then sometimes we're invited to create an installation or um, an artwork for an exhibition space. Often this will be like cultural spaces, museums, um, maybe new media galleries. Um, for example, on the right hand side uh, of this page, there's a picture of an installation we had at the Victorian Albert Museum um, in 2019 which was a kind of a food stall. So people would go through a big exhibition um, on a kind of design and, and food. And then at the end, um, we had a, this artwork in which they would um, select from a set of their values and get a bespoke taster based on what they wanted the future of the food system to look like. We also make meals and recipes. Um, so sometimes this will be like an event where we host a dinner or other times it'll be a recipe that kind of exists in the world or that we put out as a kind of provocation. Um, for example, in the center here, there's a de-extinction dinner. This is a dish from a larger project we have called de-extinction deli that looks at um, the possibility of bringing animals back from extinction and asks the question, if we, if we brought them back, would we choose to eat them um, or eat them again since a lot of them went extinct because we ate them in the first place. But this dish um, takes the, the, it's based on the passenger pigeon, um, which was a very common bird in North America and then went extinct, but um, uses the closest known living relative to the passenger pigeon um, as the, the protein and then uses fruit and vegetables that would be part of the habitat of the passenger pigeon. Um, to kind of start a discussion about, okay, if we bring animals back from extinction, that also means we have to bring back um, the habitats that would support them. And maybe one of the ways to do that would to be to integrate some of their habitat into our, into our, um, our dishes as well. And then we make labs and workshops. These can be like DIY bio workshops or um, different kinds of uh, food and cooking workshops. Or for example, on the left-hand side, we have this uh, brinjal cart which is based on kind of the same line of research that Zach was talking about, about the, the egg, eggplant in India. At this cart, visitors could come and they could um, taste a, a brinjal dish, a different dish each day. Um, it was during like, I think a five day festival. So a different dish each day, they could learn how to seed save different um, brinjal seeds, eggplant seeds. And then they could leave behind a little card that talked either about their favorite brinjal uh, recipe or a story from their past, something that reminded them um, of their favorite eggplant dish or a story about um, what a, a certain eggplant dish reminded them of maybe their childhood or family member. Um, and people could come and kind of exchange these cards or share each other's um, recipes. And uh, over the years, one mode we've kind of returned to is uh, a, a food cart, I guess you could say, or something on wheels or that's movable that allows us to assemble uh, people and ingredients and ideas uh, and, and kind of recombine them. And um, some of these have taken place in uh, formal buildings like museums, um, and other times they just pop up in the street. And so uh, this is just a drawing that shows some of the, the food carts in our, our fleet of vehicles. And some of these are still in operation. Um, a few of them have been dismantled. And uh, I think the only artwork we ever actually sold is one of the large uh, carts that became a functioning business after, which was kind of a nice end point rather than us storing it. Um, but as we go forward, it continues to be kind of a way that we think about assembling our ideas and interacting with publics. No, none of those work. Okay, so just a few definitions, and this is probably one of the things that I know we want to return to over the next year and kind of inquire for ourselves, because this is um, thinking that began already 11 years ago and, and probably has changed and needs some updating. But, um, you know, we've defined gastronomy as the art of choosing, cooking, and eating good food. And um, Part of the um, thinking there is to disrupt some of the more rationalist or reductionist 
approaches to food, which sees everything as nutrition and calories. And so uh, in our next meeting together, we wanna to talk about how we use taste and really um, privilege taste as a way of knowing and understanding food systems. And then gastronomy uh, will describe, uh, sorry, genomics will describe as an enabling scientist to study genetic variability and interactions between all of an organism's genes and the environment. And that's kind of a mouthful, but we're often um, thinking about and engaging in uh, contemporary life sciences discourse. So as outsiders looking in on what the life sciences are doing and being really interested about uh, thinking across scales. So not reducing things to just genes, but thinking about um, interactions between genes, the environment, organisms within a population, uh, and kind of working across those different scales the life sciences um, takes place. At. So uh, we sometimes define genomic gastronomy as the study of the organisms and environments manipulated by human food cultures. Yeah, um, it kind of uh, started back in 2000, and 10. And at the time, molecular gastronomy was really popular as a concept or a, a practice where it was all about kitchen chemistry and reducing um, everything down to kind of comp component parts and then building up an, a flavor experience. And um, with our interest in biology and ecology, we're like, well, what would it look like if you tried to fit a whole food system onto a plate? And so that was sort of our starting point from for doing this type of work. And I think that's since become a very popular concept in some ways with um, various restaurants thinking in this way as well. Um, and it's exciting to see, see this as it evolves. <laughs> so um, we'll tell you uh, about kind of three projects, one that's more past facing, one that's a bit about the present and one that's sort of about the future. Mm -hmm. um, so these are kind of all around this topic of ingredients. And after presenting these three projects, we'll um, pause for our first conversational moment. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is Cobalt 60 sauce, uh, which is a barbecue sauce that we created from mutation bred varieties of plants. Um, and it came about because we discovered this notion of mutation breeding or pr practice, you could say, um, which is essentially exposing seeds or plants to radiation to create mutations. And then if there's a mutation that happens that's um, uh, positive for whatever reason, then that uh, variety, that new variety is, is bred uh, further. Um, so here's a short timeline that we put on the, as part of the packaging of this final bottle and the ingredients that were included. Um, and at the bottom, it shows uh, radiation bread varieties. And we spent some time trying to uncover what this radiation breeding um, was all about. So after the Second World War, uh, the US started a program called Athens for Peace. Um, and as seen in their kind of logo, uh, agriculture is one of the places where this technology was applied. Um, and at the time it was uh, thought of, on the one hand, oh, it can save the world. And on the other hand, oh, it's a terrible technology that's going to destroy humanity. So we must destroy it. Uh, and so it was a very kind of polarizing, contentious, uh, um, yeah, technology, you could say. So here's a, a poem written by a very positive DIY kind of gardener who was given a, a, a peanut seed to grow in the UK. Um, and she talks about it as like, uh, yeah, it holds a glittering promise in its green leaves, the promise of victory over famine, or um, it's the first atomic peanut. It's a lush green plant and gives you a strange, almost alarming sense of thrusting power and lusty health. So that's obviously a very kind of <laughs> positive propagandistic um, uh, take on, on this technology. And then more recently, this is a diagram from the New York Times um, that shows the sort of varieties that are currently uh, results from mutation breeding practices. 
um, and it's almost 50% is in cereals, but there's, there's um, yeah, other, other plants as well. And traditionally, um, it, these gamma gardens were the kind of geographies where this research happened. So from the center, this cobalt 60 source or some other radioactive source would come up and expose all the plants and seeds to radiation. And then the scientists pick out which ones seem to have mutated in an interesting way. Um, I think the, this technique, it's not as visual anymore. Um, it's much more happens within closed rooms and um, it's not so common anymore as practice. But if you're interested, you can look at this website, the IAEA, International Agency for- uh, Atomic Energy. Yeah. Um, their website, you can search mutant varieties. So that's where we kind of found the information that we wanted for our cobalt 60 sauce. So uh, while we were living in Portland, we just went to a local supermarket and found three varieties of grapefruit and took them home and tested them against the, the database. And it turns out two out of the three were actually from this um, mutation breeding uh, history. So the star ruby was uh, developed in 1970. Um, and it's, yeah, so this is sort of what a search would it, so it's, um, seedless was the benefit in this one, um, or this, yeah. And then the Rio Red also comes up, and that was in 1984. And here its uh, color was a deeper red. And so it was seen as sort of uh, more visually interesting, I suppose. And so, yeah, so as a way of bottling this history of remembering it, and it was especially during the time of a huge discussion around introduction of GMOs and seeing a lot of the same conversation points or debate discussions uh, from both sides of the, um, of the debate. So we wanted to draw throughout this history. And um, we also, created this image to promote our barbecue sauce with, with Heather, Julius, our chef, uh, who, who designed the, in, the recipe for the sauce is holding it in the, as in the center of the image. Maybe one just um, small point I'm remembering is as much as there were similarities between the mutation bread uh, in the first round, it'll destroy us, it'll, it'll end starvation. One big difference we noticed was that those were state programs and so a lot of that information ended up in publicly accessible databases like Kat was just showing you whereas the GMO information a lot of it is hidden it's, it's private research and it's hidden behind confidential business information so you can't access a lot of that information so that was one big distinction was kind of this transition from state-sponsored um, you know you could say liberal-minded science of the mid-century to this sort of much more privatized uh, life sciences of the 90s and 2000s so that's mm -hmm. kind of yeah yeah looking at what was different as well yeah, yeah. so um so kat talked about the cobalt 60 sausage is kind of a historic based project um and this one we wanted to share as a kind of contemporary one this is a project we created called the cedomatic it's a vending machine uh, with the slogan vending at the speed of life because um, the, the idea was for it to be uh, the slowest vending machine to ever exist because it sold seeds and bags of soil. And so you could go buy your seeds, buy your soil uh, and grow your own snack and eventually you would be able to eat it. Um, but behind that, <laughs> there was another kind of purpose, which was um, a, a vending machine that would be dispensing unique seeds with cultural and ecological or culinary significance. Um, so to create this project, we go to the next one, I think. Um, we first reached out to several seed savers uh, in the Portland area at the time. This was in 2013. And so, for example, in the right hand corner, we have a seed saver who had kind of a garden city farm in in um, in Portland, and they had bred a special uh, mix between kale and collard, which they called uh, kaleard seeds or kaleard plants. 
And so the seed savers shared with us the seeds that we put in the vending machine, but also they shared their st the stories of the seeds, um, why they chose them, and then also how to save them again so that uh, the next person could also save seeds for that plant. Um, the Seedomatic uh, is, is kind of a unique project for us because in some ways we're not so sure if it's an artwork anymore because um, it has taken on a whole life of its own. Uh, we collaborated later with Lane Selman from the Culinary Breeding Network in Portland also, in the Portland, Oregon region. She, um, she runs the Culinary Breeding Network, which brings together uh, plant breeders with chefs to try to, to make uh, select or breed plants that are culinary culinarily desirable. So either they have good uh, flavor or are good for being cooked or prepared in a certain way. Um, and so she has uh, essentially hosted this machine for the last, I don't know, five, six years. Um, and it's gone around to lots of different uh, festivals and um, farmers markets and different seed events to share different seeds with all different stories. And so uh, later it went also to Colby College in Maine, where they collaborated with a local seed uh, company that um, sold only, I think it was all open source seeds um, to start to kind of tell that story and make those seeds accessible on the Colby campus. So for us, I think this is a, a, a lovely project that has its own kind of real world life, somewhat without us at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're excited to see kind of where it continues to go in the future. Emma, we weren't rushing you. We got cat accidentally pressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think um, that's good. <laughs> we, I think we'll do smog tasting. It's a little bit longer than the other two, but it'll give us just one more thing to look at before we talk. Um, who's, I, who's doing this one? I forget. I think you are. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so um, smog tasting uses egg foams to harvest air pollution so that smog from different locations can be tasted and compared. And this began um, uh, back at Shrishti again in Bengaluru where Kat and I were teaching a workshop and um, the class started out mm, initially to like build uh, pollution sensors and like sort of do digital stuff, but everyone thought that um, wasn't so interesting. Um, because it would just be more data on a screen and that's not gonna change anyone's impression about air pollution. So uh, we turned it to our uh, old standby food and politics and we were reading uh, Harold McGee's book on food and cooking as a class and uh, ran across, because that's a very dry technical book mostly, but ran across this lovely poetic phrase of, thanks to eggs, we are able to harvest the air. Uh, at the stiff peak stage, egg foam is approaching 90% air. And that term harvest the air kind of caught our attention. And so we started developing um, this smog tasting work with uh, students <coughs> at Trishti. And we went around uh, Bengaluru and uh, took snapshots uh, of air in different locations and then uh, tasted it and fed it to people. So we started developing this idea that smog is an invisible ingredient. It uh, can impact our taste buds pretty directly in how we can taste. Um, and we could, um, by visiting different neighborhoods, uh, that had different traffic conditions or other air quality conditions kind of uh, taste that invisible ingredient. We kind of always conceived of this as a very open project that others could take and build on. Um, and uh, we got actually contacted by a journalist um, from Bogota who wanted to do uh, smog tasting for herself with her uh, peers. So that was lovely, they, they conducted that. And we could see that then um, getting feedback from lots of people. This was a, a technique that could bring people to the sites of pollution, start to inquire and to use a different, use their body and their sense of taste and smell rather than that more passive abstract version of looking at things on a screen or reading about it. Um, so we've continued to do different variations uh, throughout the years. Um, we don't need to travel ourselves always. So in, in Delhi, we collaborated uh, with some uh, a gallery and some students who wanted to conduct some smog tastings. Um, but for ourselves, we had more questions about how we could maybe understand and compare um, smog from different locations or even different moments in history. And so um, uh, our collaborator, Nicola Twilley, went down and visited this uh, room-sized smog synthesizer at University of California, um, not Santa Cruz. Rivers, Riverside. 
Riverside, yes, thank you. And so this is what a smog synthesizer looks like uh, in their lab. Um, different precursor chemicals are pumped in to simulate the different kinds of chemicals that um, uh, the different kinds of smog are formed from. And um, with the help of um, the scientist there who gave us kind of a napkin sketch about how we can make our own, we made our own smog synthesizer, which in retrospect is insane, but I guess is what happens, we don't know any better. Um, so we pumped in our own precursor chemicals so that we could uh, create smog conditions from different locations and uh, geographies and times, and then whip those into meringues. And so you can see uh, London pea soup smog, which doesn't exist anymore, but was there at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, was one of the kind of smogs that we could simulate or, or whip up. And we also found that a lot of the language used by scientists uh, in this field over the last 70, 80 years uh, were very related to uh, cookery or kitchens. So they talk about baking or cooking the smogs and ingredients. And um, there's even some crossovers that Nicola found between food scientists working on the artificial pineapple and smog. So a lot of really unusual uh, connections. Someone has a question in the chat that's related. Um, how does the smog transmute into flavor through the egg foam? What is the reaction happening in the whipping process that causes that? So I think uh, one of the reasons we wanted to make the smog synthesizer is because in our when we did the initial smog tastings, um, we couldn't taste much except for egg whites and sugar. But when we were in Bangalore, a few of them really um, had like part visible particulate matter. So we knew something else was there, but it was um, not engaging the sense of smell or taste as much as you would like, right? You, it was sort of like mostly obfuscated by egg whites and sugar. So here, when we made the smog synthesizer, we very much could smell um, the smog because before we put it into the egg whites, uh, it was in this box, which had a small hole in the top that you could um, pump a small, uh, blast out of. And there you could really both visually see and smell the different typologies of smog. So um, when there was more, uh, let me take back the recipes, but sometimes it was really eggy, sometimes it actually burned your throat and you could visually see it in this case as well, which was a, a, you know, a, a secondary And way. to create um, the NO2, we would put copper into some acid and it's a smell, it's, it's quite common uh, for car exhaust to release that, um, that smell. And I think we all became more attuned to pollution in the street or out in the world after having kind of this overdosed experience through the smog synthesizer, deeply smelling and knowing um, the smell of these different kind of chemicals and such. And I'll show you in a second, we've done more and more now with smellings because the, you know, the taste was difficult. We also don't run the synthesizer anymore because uh, we decided uh, we, we didn't know exactly what it was doing for our health and we wanted to, yeah. <laughs> I, I think some of the other aspects um, that we learned about this was uh, the different typologies of smog. So, um, you know, both, the things you'd expect like coal-fired power plants and uh, automobiles, but also things like chemical plants or um, uh, ag uh, agricultural smog coming from off-gassing of uh, uh, feces uh, from animals and even some cont contributions from non-anthropogenic uh, sources like uh, pine trees. So sort of understanding that smogs do have a taste and a flavor and a typology. Um, so yeah, Central Valley, I suppose you guys would be a good example where you're you know, having actually intensive industrial agriculture leading to smog, which is not something we knew a lot about before we started this project. And that was sort of, I guess, the point as well was um, it was people's desire to taste or smell that then have them ask more questions about their own local conditions uh, and to use their body in that way. Uh, we shared this with um, both, I guess, you amateurs and experts and so on the right, it's Nicola, Twilly, and myself um, set up in New York City between a real lemonade stand and a real sandwich shop. And so it's a very interesting place to be doing smog taste. And on the other side, Emma's there at the World Health Organization um, talking to the health ministers from every country in the world. So very different audiences, but kind of really great prompt to start conversations and get specific about sort of the causes and inputs of air pollution. 
Um, Emma, are you keeping an eye on the comments and questions? I don't have them up here. AM, yes. We can do them later. Um, so then um, smog tasting takeout. Oh, this is you, actually. Um, yeah. So uh, actually, this also kind of relates to the question before. In I think it was in 2017, we um, were asked by the World Wildlife Fund and National Geographic to run um, a, a smog tasting event as part of a conference they were holding on behavior change. Um, and so we, we were finally able to realize one of our dream versions of this project that was logistically more challenging, which was to have different people, um, kind of participants or collaborators at different locations um, in various countries throughout the world do a smog, um, a smog whipping at different times, or sorry, same time, but different places and mail them in to, all, to us in Washington, DC. So I th yeah, we had uh, Beijing, London, Mumbai, Perth, um, Barcelona, and Porto. I think that was the, and then in Washington. Um, and so we were able to do a kind of live smog tasting from different locations around the world with, um, with real harvested smog from those sites. And this one, most of the meringues tasted about the same. We mailed people a kit. So um, they had sugar um, and they had to use their own eggs. We didn't mail the eggs. <laughs> uh, and then, but other than that, it was pretty much uh, all the same recipe, same ingredients, same protocol, same cooking time, as much as we could do more or less equally, we did. And all, a lot of the meringues didn't have that much of a taste difference, but the one from Mumbai had like a very clearly metallic taste at the end, like after you kind of fit, got through the sugar. Um, and I think a lot, it was, that was a pretty cool experience for us because we were finally able to kind of compare these ones from really different um, areas. And then in 2019, we had an uh, installation of a smog tasting in Hong Kong. Um, it was a similar idea, but it was with, throughout different locations in the city. So I think there were maybe five or six smog harvesters, five smog harvesters from different sites. And then um, those meringues all came together at the, the city hall, which is where the exhibition was. But this was during um, some of the most intense uh, protests. I think it was no uh, November 2019. And um, we were talking a lot at that time about how kind of civil unrest or different kind of um, political or social issues can also really contribute to air pollution because here we had um, a lot of fires happening and then also the um, tear gas. And these were becoming smells and kind of flavors of the city that were more and more prevalent and um, kind of common for people. Uh, and they were very easily recognizable. So this kind of um, brought this idea of smog tasting and the flavor of the air to a kind of a whole different place. And I think like a lot of our projects will have like a very small idea and make a prototype and see if it has some legs. And then for good or bad, once there's something that sticks, we kind of keep doing it as, as, and working with different groups that want to utilize the idea. And so we did a smog tasting in Hungary during um, COVID. And the, it was really interesting because the arts organization collaborated with two NGOs, a kind of regional and a national one. And uh, one of the NGOs was very skeptical about this. And then when they actually did it, they are, what they did for air quality testing was this little black box. And they said they could see right away that just by having this sort of simple costuming, more of the public was engaged and wanted to ask questions. So that was kind of a nice uh, moment where you saw the different ways that the arts, um, you know, could get beyond a black box. Uh, and then ourselves during COVID, you know, we were just we figuring have... out what, we... what's that? Oh, sorry, we have two, two more questions. Oh yeah. Um, what about the textures and who would be attributed as the chef in these cases? Uh, the textures, <laughs> in India, we started to sometimes um, recommend that uh, in warmer weather, people uh, put ice below the bowl because you know in, in warm weather, the, the foam can collapse. And so that's one of the things to be thinking about with the texture. And um, I think in the most polluted environments, also the egg foam collapses. Like it gets a little bit not nice. Uh, 
it gets more soggy. Yeah. Either so, like I said, sometimes it's visual particulate matter, and then um, yeah, depending Even, on the time. I was gonna say with the smog synthesizer, one of the DIY ingredients was um, was a dust because that, that can be even particulate matter, and we would literally pick up dust from the room we were making the meringues in and put it in the batter, and people would ask, "Oh, how'd you how'd you create the dust?" And you're like, the floor. <laughs> so that changed the texture a little bit too. And I should always say most of the projects we do are uh, trying to be quite generous and invite people in with um, joyous and celebratory flavors. Uh, but of course, it's sometimes important to confront people. But we always try to be extremely upfront and clear about what people are eating and letting them opt in or opt out. And I think that's also useful when you have sort of more um, confrontational work is to um, find a way of people to opt out and feel like they're still participating or included. And that's, that's, that's OK, and that's part of it. And we haven't formally done any larger versions like a pavlova, although, you know, wherever you make a meringue based uh, meal, it'll have some sort of, uh, it'll have elements of whatever air quality uh, you have. In them. <laughs> and the chef, I guess, would say this was the thing about the invisible ingredient, which is that, um, you know, as we talked to people about air quality and how it affects taste and smell. Um, it does, uh, it's a bit like astronauts, right? They actually can massively reduce the ability to taste and smell because you're clogged up, but also the chemicals dead in different parts of your tasting system. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you, you may want to like up the pungency of your cooking if uh, you're in strong air pollution conditions. And it's, there's some thought that like, that's why street food is so pungent to, to break through uh, the sort of dead in taste buds. Yeah, that people experience. And chef attribution is just whoever happened to cook it, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we started doing smellings. I just want to get through so we can have a more open conversation. So you can download the guided smog smelling on the websites. But, um, you know, we, what do we do with ourselves during COVID? We can't serve food or get together. So you can see our socially distanced guided smog smellings here in Bergen, Norway, where Kat and I were locked in for the last two years. And um, this was actually amazing. And this is why this tool has become so useful. You know, people would think about Norway, it is very beautiful and very green, but actually some of the worst air quality in Europe is um, in this part of Bergen city center and right where we lived in this part because of the um, poor fuel quality of a lot of the ships that have come in and the, the air gets trapped in the mountains and where we used to live, there's a small pass and all the automobile traffic um, goes between seven mountains and gets trapped. And um, going to the roof of this building and spending time up there, we could definitely see bad smog days and really smell a difference. And it also is starting to use these like flavor and smell wheels and get, getting people to hone in um, on their uh, sensory apparatus. And uh, the day we did that on the roof, here's what happened down the street. There was a wildfire, uh, I think it was a barbecue that got out of hand. Like that. on the top of the mountain. And, and so Bergen's this unusual place where because of climate change, there's both um, wildfire warnings and um, flood warnings in the same day because of increased drought and then increased um, intensity of rain events. Uh, so yeah, that was the, the wildfire on, on our guided smog smelling day. And then most recently, uh, smog smelling yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna take uh, a break here now to talk to y'all and uh, see if you want to ask us questions about anything at all we've talked about or just anything you're interested in. You can type or speak. <laughs> I guess I have a question to, to maybe kick it off is, um, and I had asked you all a little earlier about the what to do with this data. I mean, the smog tasting specifically and the the, um, the meringues make me think a lot of the, the conversations around environmental justice and how it's the responsibility is often placed on individuals rather than anything broader than that. So I guess I'm kind of curious about you know, what kind of conversations come out of these experiments and um, if it leads to action. I think smog tasting has been great because it's 
something we've tried to share as a tool and for anyone to use. So number one activist in Pittsburgh um, asked, oh, can I borrow this for um, this action I wanna do out, uh, you know, outside of the specific site? I was like, yeah, definitely. And I think that they were interested in it if for its sort of symbolic potential to rally people um, and to kind of tell that particular story. Um, so, so yeah, people have used it uh, in that way uh, to sort of actively point to sources of pollution that might be less well known or to advocate. And then I think at the level of, so that's more like, to, you know, street level and then the level of policy, it's very interesting because I guess we shouldn't underestimate the power of shaming leaders as well. And so like the health ministers, you know, they were all like, oh, your country is the worst or your city is the worst. And that was sort of interesting to see them have this moment of trying to like not be shamed at the World Health Organization because the different smogs were on offer. So those are like two ways that I can think of. And uh, also, I, I guess we just learned a ton in the process about different contributors and maybe that's another value of the tool is to sort of get into the nitty gritty of you know not the individual responsibilities but what are those um unforeseen contributors to air quality that aren't just like automobiles and coal and who are the specific what are the specific sites and mm -hmm. what are they doing when when we were in hong kong um so basically hot Hong Kong, I'll say generally, some people like to blame, say that China on the other side has all these factories and it's coming across and making this beautiful island um, dirty. And uh, there's an interesting reality, which is a lot of those factories are owned by people in Hong Kong. So there's this kind of passing back and forth of factory pollution. And, you know, where does we, we talk about um, the kind of pollution as being part of um, an airshed, like you would have a, a watershed, but airshed. And so you, you're sharing things even across um, political or ocean boundaries that you, you maybe wouldn't be expecting to share. And the responsibility gets kind of passed around. So um, I think sometimes smog tasting is just about opening up those conversations also. I think we're usually doing these projects now with like interlocutors that know a lot more about the local conditions. So we're working on a smog smelling project right now in Delhi. And, you know, there it's also about being really sensitive to what the conversations are at the moment. And so in Delhi, a lot of urbanites will blame you know, farmers and rural populations for burning fields and crops for the bad Delhi air quality. But that's just like one of many contributors. And so we're trying to take our cues from them and have that conversation about how this um, tool could be used to not exacerbate that um, blame game and, and, and do something else. So we can report back later this year how that goes, but that's just an example of, you know, the difference Mm, yeah, different populations and who gets blamed. Yeah. I think we have a question from Aja. I don't know if I say your name correctly. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's Asia. Asia. I'm, I'm trying to get my thoughts together because it's mostly just like a bunch of feelings right now. And I think that that <laughs> maybe is like a testament to um, the complexity of the work because I'm just having so many mixed feelings about like each project that you've presented so far. Um, also, I spent a lot of time in Portland. And so I know pretty um, intimately the like, like mutant foodie culture in terms of just like how, how just like beyond it is like maybe one of the most concentrated and like obsessive forms of foodiness that I've ever experienced. So that makes sense to me. And I know like foodie stuff is all over the world now, but I just like, um, yeah, I think of it as almost like a, a really specific regional cultural approach to these kinds of questions, I guess. Um, yeah, so maybe that's just a reflection, but um, I heard you saying, I saying both confrontational and celebratory as a way of describing your work. And I guess I was wondering um, whether it's really intentional to just to, to create a, a space in which 
you're trying to do multiple things at once or like pulling on people's emotions in different ways. Um, and one more thing I was thinking about was like the mutant plants. Like, is anyone, do you know if anyone is using this technology of like intentionally using radiation to intentionally mutate plants in order to create um, possible adaptations to climate change is another question that I had. So that's a, that's a real question. <laughs> Everything else is kind of just like feelings based reflections and all that is just to say that, um, yeah, the work is giving me a lot to, to feel and a lot to like think through eventually when my brain starts working a little better. And uh, I, th I think the second uh, question you asked about the confrontation versus celebratory, I think that each project has a different tone. And it's usually with the audience in mind that's being, you know, engaged or work with. So, you know, smog tasting, we're going in and it's sort of just by the name, you know, that there's something a bit odd, right? Um, I think other moments we're working with specific institutions or communities, you know, Emma was mentioning the Brinjal uh, tasting, Brinjal seed saving. That's more of a celebration of agricultural biodiversity and, and history of that, of that cuisine. So, um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of different tones and modes. I mean, part of that might be that we're schizophrenic, but also part of it, I think, is this we've been doing this for 11 years. So we, you know, there's different moments where we're calling up different emotions. Um, the third question, I'm pretty sure, yes. Uh, if you go to that database, it's still being updated and there are still radiation breeding programs ongoing. And some of them I'm sure are about adapting crops to like, um, saline uh, situations. Um, but the reason that technology is less, or that technique is less implemented is because it's so scattershot. So it is sort of like, you know, just mutating a bunch of plants and then doing um, phenotypical. What happens. Yeah. Whereas now with CRISPR and other technologies, I think, obviously it's a lot more complicated than it, it, it sounds like often, but uh, I think that there's more, energy and focus on more targeted change or uh, yeah, modifications to plants than, than a mutation breeding process, which is pretty random. And there's also a lot of like breeding programs that aren't transgenic or even using like um, life sciences techniques. There's a lot of ways now to analyze, right? The, the range of variation if you're doing sort of traditional breeding um, and so that's a technique that some plant breeders are using, especially in Europe or Asia, where, you know, citizens are not in favor of transgenic organisms um, or it's illegal. So, so there's sort of just like a, such a wide range of ways of manipulating plants now, some that are assisted by high technology and some that aren't. But yeah, the, that, that database is pretty interesting. So you could definitely um, go see what they're up to because they do update it regularly. Cool. Oh, thank you. I don't mind it. Oh, Portland. Oh, yeah. So we had none of us have been there, have never haven't been there for the last six years. Um, we've all been based in Europe. And um, there's obviously just a range of uh, food cultures everywhere. But um, definitely the sort of like intensity of foodiness that you're describing in Portland, which I think we can all agree uh, is we're like we're sitting in Amsterdam right now. And uh, that's similarly uh, intense, both good and bad. Right. So like weird stoner food for the tourists. Uh, uh, as well as really interesting and thoughtful um, approaches to bringing heritage grains back to the menu. So that's all yeah, uh, happening here. Uh, what is mutant foodie culture exactly? <laughs> yes, it's mostly just to say that like foodie culture um, as if it was mutated to be some like extreme version of, of the original foodie culture. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, just we have a lot very of, uh, extreme. It's like maybe, or maybe more like foodie culture on steroids is maybe a better way to describe it, but. <laughs> it's kind of crazy with both like internet and social media and sort of global use of English, which is mostly what we have access to, some Norwegian, some Portuguese. Um, but we have a lot of collaborators in India and, um, especially in the south of India, like there's just a real explosion of foodie type projects and focus happening there. Yeah, and both like forward looking, future looking, mutant looking, as well as like um, re 
theming grandma's recipes or uh, heritage varieties. Mm -hmm. So David Harris, do you want to ask your question? Uh, good morning, early morning from Brisbane, Australia. Thank you so much for this. It's, it's fascinating um, and uh, fun and provocative and all kinds of things. I was really interested in your comment about one of the projects, I've forgotten the name, sorry, about how you didn't know if it was art anymore. And uh, because it sort of became a real world thing. At the moment, I live probably a little bit more in the design world than, than the art world, but really crossing boundaries. And one of the design methods that we sometimes use is called design fictions, which people are not necessarily aware of, but typically involves creating artifacts from the near future as a way of exploring potential futures. And sometimes this sort of feeds back into the process toward designing, you know, thinking about what futures you want and designing for them. And so I, I guess, you know, through that frame, if you've got projects that are becoming kind of real in a sense, does this provide you know another outlet? To what extent have you have you considered um, you know using these some of these projects to enact change or trying to enact change through the creation of kind of real things rather than artistic um, projects? If if you can draw a difference, just yeah. thinking about the application that we were writing today. What did it ask? It, it defined four four things it was like is your project an idea a, something a, a prototype meaning it exists in the world or uh what was the fourth one a real thing it's used in the world something like that they had this definition will there be innovation between, spillovers will there be innovation? but it was like yeah basically asking is it a thing that exists in the world or is it a thing that's used in the world and i thought oh that's such a funny definition we don't usually and you, you did about. say the magic, uh, David said the magic slash, slash scary word. So uh, I guess we could open up this can of worms, but uh, uh, speculative design, design fiction um, is not something I was aware of until I met Kat. And um, I was coming more of a tactical media and sort of um, politics and art space, which is, I guess was I was familiar with in North America and then knew little about what was happening in the UK and Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was at uh, the Royal College of Art in London in um, 2000, uh, when did I graduate? 2009, I think. <laughs> yeah, 2009. And uh, so that was with um, Dunn and Raby, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby, who wrote a book called Speculative Everything. And um, uh, there on my shelf, yep. <laughs> yeah, who kind of sort of very much think about design fictions and speculative futures and things. So I come from that heritage, <laughs> I guess you could say, but- um, we, we just own all of our heritages that, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we're usually somewhere, but we get invited to design stuff and architecture stuff. And actually the only place we don't get invited much is art things. <laughs> So it's a funny Art thing. With a capital A. Things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, we're, we're happy to have this ambiguity where our, our work can um, be in a bio art show or it can be at a design type place. Yeah. And I think those conversations are interesting in the context, but maybe not outside of them. I've also taught in a relatively conservative design school where uh, they looked at my work and they just completely thought I was nuts and was like, you're not doing design. I was like, well, I don't actually care what you call it. You can call it art. It's uh, just um, different approaches for thinking through new ways of imagining the world. <laughs> and I, but I've got, a, got a kind of specific, serious question, which I think we can maybe start to try to address, which is like, oh, you know, or like, could these things do activity in the world outside of art? I mean. That's the hope. I think we'd like to situate our work outside of art with a capital A. And, um, you know, for the first five years, we just did stuff on the streets because like we were in the US and there's no arts funding. So we just were like doing things. Uh, it was more of, of being in a cr crappy band than, but, you know, then we moved to Europe and they occasionally pay us. Um, but then you have to play in, with the institutions. So that's sort of been a change in our work. But um, I, it's also a question of where you do want to situate yourself. Uh, and we've sort of kind of awkwardly straddled this uh, uh, cultural art space with an academic space and occasionally uh, semi kind of corporate space. And uh, I think 
real world, you know, it's kind of all of those places, right? <laughs> real world is also a novel that inspires many people to reimagine their position on something or, you know. But uh, um, the pseudomatic is an interesting one. I think we, we, we were preparing for this talk and we wanted to really highlight that. And I think what we meant by that was, uh, it was kind of not a throwaway project, but it was like a pun. And we're like, this is funny, we should build this. And then we were almost underwhelmed by what um, it was, because it was just sort of like a pun. But then the, the sort of people who were active in the space of like seed saving found it to be an extremely useful tool. And so we were very happy for them to keep using it. But we were kind of like, really? This is just not that interesting. So I think it was our own expectations of what is interesting. And then just acknowledging that for those sets of users, this continued to be extremely fruitful as a way to share their stories about um, either preserving heritage varieties or, or, or sharing new um, varieties, new uh, public seed varieties. And I think that just came as a surprise to us because we were just like, I don't know, man, it's just the thing we made, but yeah, you can have it. I, I think it's also the way that other people, <clears throat> like their perspective of it, where they, for them, it is a useful tool. So it's not, they don't like, oh, here, I'm, I'm setting up an artwork at the farmer's markets. No, it's a thing to sell interesting seeds that have been carefully selected with specific stories or a reason for being there. And I think, um, the other thing is that <clears throat> a lot of our works, like we've already mentioned a few times, we do kind of set up or release or at least try to make some structure for them to be open source or um, re reusable in some ways by other people. So if somebody wants to make like a Loki restaurant, uh, did we talk about that one? No, it's coming up. You'll learn about that. <laughs> if somebody wants to make a restaurant for one of the concepts, I think we would be excited about that. That's just not maybe our role specifically. And uh, yeah, thank, there was yeah. I'm just going to say thank you so much because actually there's a lot in here that I can use with my design students when we talk about this as examples of there are ways that this can be applied to critical design frameworks and yeah. thinking about uh, design interventions and so i'm just really interested in that in that crossover and I've, I've even had students who've looked at conceptual seed projects um they don't have the skills and backup to make them but uh starting points and so i find that place thank you very much for all of this yeah, yeah yeah i think often it's also useful to collaborate with people who know what they're doing <laughs> that's our that's our technique <laughs> Expert, so, expert generalist for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, Asia, to your point about um, the ideas and making, I think that's why we work good as a, as a small group of three with lots of collaborators, because um, we all have different appetites and capacity for um, coming up with ideas than seeing them through. So uh, yeah, I think that's why we work well as a collective. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll just share a few more projects and have a second conversation. Yeah. 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 So, Oh, somebody let's, raised let's, their hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so let's do that first. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I also just wanted to reiterate what everyone was saying. I thought this was extremely interesting. And I come from more of a scientific background. I'm doing like marine conservation research. Um, and I'm like really interested as, in immersive art as like a form of outreach for that sort of thing. Um, and I was just curious, I know you guys mentioned that you sort of balance the line between confrontational and celebratory art. Um, do you like find that one is more effective than the other? Because I know it's sort of analogous to the sort of climate change conversations, whether it's better to like induce fear or optimism in people. Um, and yeah, I was wondering what the general re reactions to your artwork has been. Um, and then also just like culturally how that's different um, and whether it's like some universal reaction. I think that the one one of the uh, kind of principles that we often go by is that whatever we do, we want it to have feel inviting in some sense. So, for example, um, you know, rather than like screaming "meat is murder" and throwing blood at people, uh, it's perhaps better to cook like an amazing vegan meal without necessarily forefronting the fact that there's no meat involved and kind of having a celebration around this uh, instead of um, a conference, like, you know, if, if we're looking at these sort of classic 
uh, animal rights activism techniques. Uh, so I, but, uh, and I'm also perhaps not a very confrontational person. <laughs> I've got other people who can be, but <laughs> it, it, it's a little bit based on what your personality is too. I think what works best uh, in the work that you do, you know, what do you feel comfortable doing with people and or for people or uh, against? <laughs> um, and how, so figuring that out for yourself, I think is also useful. Um, and that there is no one right way or wrong way of, of um, trying to do these things. I think something also, because you said you were coming maybe for more from the sciences, something we haven't foregrounded is our own um, uh, unhappiness with contemporary art. This has changed a lot in 20 years, but 20 years ago, like, oh, it doesn't make sense, so it's art, right? And sort of, so we have a deep desire to say what we're doing is art, sometimes design or architecture, but usually art, but that it can be legible and that we're speaking in a way and in, in, in creating uh, experiences that are meaningful and legible for the people we're working with. And those aren't always a general public. So we might be working in a geographic or cultural context, or we might be working in like in a domain context where like we've done pieces where the audience is um, five life scientists at a lab, and that is the audience, and that the work should be legible for them and do a certain function. Um, and in other cases, you know, we're going to be making a meal for 20 people, and it has to be inclusive and thoughtful for those 20 people who will know ahead of time maybe who they are. So I think it's, um, it, which is why I think we don't, we, in the past, we maybe weren't invited to art stuff, but we took audiences seriously, right? And like, maybe there's still this idea in contemporary art that, oh, artists just make stuff, and then the world has to meet them there. Into that. Hmm. I think to, <clears throat> to Asia's point in the chat, it seems like hospitality is a crucial element of your work. I think I think that's true. And I think it's hospitality in this kind of larger sense of um, yeah, meeting people, try, trying really hard to earnestly meet everyone where they're at and to be open and inviting. Um, and we do that. I think a lot of the stuff maybe um, it's not so much like uh, controversial or it's, it's actually more like we give a lot of options and then we like to discuss and debate those amongst ourselves and with the public or with a specialized uh, uh, audience and um it's not uh I don't think that that is it's like it's not a negative thing in any way I think it's so also cele celebratory at the same time yeah commensality yeah <laughs> um, I guess we'll just do a few more quick projects. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, to just yeah, create some more space for discussion. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do them all. So Emma, help us decide as we go through what we can skip because we certainly can't do six. Yeah, minutes. we have too yeah. much. Yeah, we have too much content. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and uh... we have other. <laughs> let's, see. Uh, let's see. what we can do. Nothing unusual there. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, we did put some pieces together that were about menus and um, so moving beyond ingredients. And then we have some pieces at the end about uh, guests. Mm -hmm. So maybe we pick one. one from each. Yeah, I think we can skip PSSD. Should we do Loki or? Yeah, sure. Do you want to start it? And then I can do towards the yeah, end. Yeah, so this is back in the Portland days, Emma and I standing in front of the streets um, <laughs> uh, during uh, the, the, the sort of weekly markets. And so, Photographed um, by Cat. Oh yeah, I'll, photo, I'll photo credit. <laughs> the two loud Americans and the photographer. So um, we uh, started this out um, saying Loki Food Lab is a traveling food cart for prototyping, serving, and debating a range of bioregional food futures at different sites around the world. And um, so the way it actually works in the most simple form is that the visitor comes to the food cart and instead of being offered a menu of different foods, they're offered a list of attributes and they answer the question, a great food system should be. Uh, based on the attributes they select, um, they get a sort of algorithm, creates a, a taster for them that's personalized. And so there's, I think, thousands of combinations. We did the math once. Uh, but they can basically choose what they think the future of food should be. And then we combine uh, 10 or so ingredients that we've previously organized with food producers from the region. 
Um, so yeah, the, the this is the low tech version that we started in Portland, where we used paper punch cards, thinking about the history of computing, uh, and the algorithm happened with a math equation on the back. That took a minute. So um, later on, when we were doing this for thousands of people, uh, had to go. We had to automate the process and use um, computers. We do joke that we're a digital last studio, so we definitely had to collaborate uh, with some more digital savvy people to make the printers all talk to the server. Um, so, what is a bioregion or ecoregion? Um, those words are used differently, especially between North America and Europe. Um, but basically, uh, it's one definition from Cascadia now. <laughs> the delineation of a bioregion has an environmental stewardship as its primary goal, with the belief that political boundaries should match ecological and cultural boundaries. And so there's a sort of deeper history that we can go into uh, at some point about where this came out of, both in uh, terms of um, drawing new boundaries on the map and looking at um, ecology as the way to do that, and also a desire to sort of reformulate um, political geography around in the, the, what's there in the environment. Um, but the basically way we use this is to take these maps that have been created about different bioregions and ecoregions in the world and say, that's the place that we're gonna source our food from and have a conversation. So you might think about it as like an expanded food shed in some ways. Uh, these are some of the previous locations uh, that we've done the Loki Food Lab. One of the things that we've tried to do is to sort of get people um, used to naming places in many different ways, uh, some that they may not be familiar with. And so, um, for example, the Celtic broadleaf bioregion goes between Scotland and Ireland. And so it's a way of delineating a shared environmental space that crosses political uh, boundaries and to sit, think if there's a shared um, food culture there as well. Unfortunately, the two, oh, we haven't updated this with the most recent one, but the two that we, we were supposed to do in China both got canceled, which is a shame because we did all the um, research with really interesting uh, food researchers, but for one reason or another, um, they got canceled. So uh, and actually not COVID, COVID well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not one reason or another. True, the second one. <laughs> we, we were in um, wet markets in January, 2020, uh, looking at animals and uh, plants and then uh, flew back one day before they shut the border. So yeah, that one got canceled for good reasons. Um, and if anybody, so, yeah. if anybody wants to invite us to do a Loki project in the Southern Hemisphere, yes. we're looking for sites because um, as of right now, it's mostly been in the North. Uh, so this uh, are two pictures from different Lokis, Cascadia and Celtic Broadleaf. And this is a sort of version about, um, so for this Cascadia bioregion, um, these are some of the different ingredients that we source working with different kinds of people. And you can see on the left, if you chose convenient, profitable, and protein rich, you would get that mix of ingredients. And on the right, if you chose <coughs> delicious, open source, and traditional, you would get a different configuration. Um, uh, what do we do with all this data? Sometimes we present it. And so this is like a, the very first rough piece of data that we collected that was the quantitative, um, just about the people we talked to. Not uh, that many at that point. Yeah, not that many <laughs> at that point. And then over time, you know, as we sort of automated the process, we sort of collected a lot more data and we started to visualize that data um, in real time data visualizations. And then uh, the Loki Food Lab, when it Became a sort of physical food cart could travel around and traveled throughout Ireland in this case, not only at cultural institutions, but also like summer festivals. Yeah, so this was the first one uh, in different places around Portland, Oregon. This is, like, I think, an important hack. So I think, Emma, you found this rule. We were trying to figure out as we were going from serving stuff in people's basements and doing like random street things, how we could organize ourselves and um, there's a law, I don't know if it was a state law or a federal law, but if you serve a small amount of food, then you don't need to get a license. Actually, I don't know, maybe you should tell us, I totally forgot. Yeah, it was like sample size. So basically in the US, the, the US is very strict um, health and safety laws compared to some other countries. Um, and so if you served a sample size amount, you could uh, do it without like having to basically become like a certified food, uh, not even server, but it had to be more than that. You had to get like, not a restaurant license, but some kind of food production license. And that and law so, was set up 
basically what so like fast food like pepsi and stuff could give out free samples yeah yeah exactly kind with, of, with like the lowest wage possible yeah so we kind yeah. of use that loophole to do these activities guerrilla style and then we brought it to scotland and this was really interesting day one we were on the street in edinburgh and day two we were in scottish parliament and serving this to the um somehow got invited to serve to uh, the scottish parliament and uh, <laughs> our box had to go through the x-ray machine which was uh, fascinating <laughs> Um, yeah, so then it got bigger physically and was set up for three months under a uh, train overpass in Dublin, Ireland, uh, near the Trinity campus. And, um, and then it was uh, for what, six months, yeah, in London at the Victorian Albert Museum as part of their um, Food Bigger Than the Plate exhibition. And I think, uh, Emma, do you want to talk about then collaborating with? Yeah, sure. Um, I think at the beginning of this project, one, you know, one of the, the bigger elements was trying to work with different chefs and food producers to source these bioregional ingredients and thinking through, um, you know, how do we get visitors to start talking about the values that they have in the food system and have a discussion about what the future of the food system should be. But as we've done this project more and more and more, another part that really started to emerge um, as we started to also grow the project into these bigger spaces or collaborate with larger institutions is that a lot of times these institutions have um, you know, sole vendor contracts or agreements with, for instance, the cafe here at the, the exhibition. And so it was a collaboration between us, the museum, and the cafe at the museum. And those um, kind of contracts that then the cafe would have uh, make it really difficult to source ingredients that are outside of their normal kind of procurement chain. So a big part of this artwork for us is working with these institutions to negotiate and essentially demand that um, we need to source some more, maybe more unusual ingredients or from smaller producers or experimental um, uh, companies that are doing something that you wouldn't typically see sold uh, in a big inst institution. And so I think um, more and more that's a part of the artwork that's like kind of, sec it, it, it's uh, becoming a primary part for us. However, maybe for a visitor, it's a secondary experience. And another thing is um, the kind of negotiations um, with the institutions about paying for and supporting the human labor that it takes to make, grow, make, serve, uh, and safely give out food in an exhibition context. Because a lot of times it's a lot cheaper to hang a painting on a wall. Um, and it's really kind of an important work for us to be arguing about the importance of the labor and the human hand um, and making sure that that's um, supported both logistically and financially throughout these processes. Yeah, yeah, and I, I putting that labor on display and, and sort of helping both the public and institution value that labor. Um, be, because I think that's, you know, if you've ever seen one of our budgets for a multi week project, it's like we're not getting much money necessarily, but to really take into account that human labor, it is just costs a lot of money that institutions aren't used to, even though they'll come to us and say, hey, we want to work on this project with you. We want to do this yeah. kind of thing. Um, so this is some of in Scotland, who was just Hopefully we're all still there. And I think we're, I, we're... I can hear you. Sorry. I think I oh, yeah. okay. that was unstable. So hopefully we're okay. Yeah, I think I can hear you. Oh, not anymore. Emma, do you want to maybe take some more questions? Yeah, I think maybe we should stop there anyways, because we yeah. only have about 10 minutes. 
True. So um, while they're coming back on, if you guys want to ask more questions or put them in the chat too, so that they'll, we can come back to them too, if they have other answers. Thanks for all sticking around. I know it's been nearly an hour and a half. It's a long one. I have a question. Hello, go for it. Hi, um, this is great, thank you. Um, my question is, um, what do you do with all the ideas that never get realized? <laughs> oh, good question. We uh, keep applying for grants for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, we try to keep no, Zach keeps a really good um, sketchbook at all times with some of the really like um, in process ideas. But a lot of the time, a, um, a lot of the initial thinking gets done through the grant writing process, not just grant writing, but or exhibition applications, these kinds of things. So sometimes we'll apply for something and we won't get it. But we realize three months later, there's another thing and we go back to that. It's kind of a nice um capture time capsule of the idea and a lot of times it'll you know we'll make sketches or different images so I definitely think that um although it's really labor intensive and exhausting <laughs> the process of the grant writing is a really important part of our practice actually mm -hmm. yeah so in, a, in, a, in a way would you say that you use the writing as a form of thinking the way uh someone who was I don't know if writing for pleasure, how, how you contrast writing for pleasure or writing for other purposes, as opposed to writing for grants. But the, when you're writing for grants, you're not, you're writing for the consumption of reviewers, not, not for a larger audience necessarily, but the mm -hmm. thinking process is no less rich. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to be honest, the grants that we're applying for aren't so much like, um, because we have applied for bigger, whatever it is, governmental things or academic stuff, but typically the things we write for, um, we do use a lot of the same language that we use for the public because they are trying to find a piece that usually will be shared with the public. Mm -hmm. So um, that writing process is really important. And I think we all have different skills in the studio, which is why it's really nice to be working together. Um, Zach does a lot of the initial writing <clears throat> and ideation. I think that's a really big part of his practice. Um, and so we used to joke that the, the grant writing was the art and that everything else that came after that was just <laughs> the rest of it because we would spend so much time doing that part and finessing the language but also yeah it's not just writing it's also image making um and trying to tell a really clear story not just about the idea but then how it's going to be realized um and then we also do do a lot of like uh blog posts now more and more maybe instagram but with text involved so that we're kind of always complementing every kind of image or graphic making with um, with some text-based work as well. Let me see if uh, I see a text from, we're trying to get back on, but not sure. Okay. <laughs> I think their internet went down. Um, yeah, but yeah, thank you for the question, because I think sometimes when we show all these images, that, yeah, the writing part gets goes missing, but it's a really important part of our practice. In some regards, my question was more around the fact that when, when you do the kind of work that you're doing, you're constantly researching and constantly having ideas and constantly bouncing off each other, I imagine, and bouncing off the material itself. And so there are always snippets of ideas that never evolve. Yeah. That, that never turn into things. And, it, and, and in many regards, I mean, your answer was, was really interesting. Um, but, but if we come back to the intention behind my question, um, I, I don't know, in, the, in some ways, like if I look at the image that's behind you and I can think about the, 
these ideas that are never really realised as kind of scraps on the table that never quite make it into the meal or into the dish. But what do we do with them? We still do something with them. You know, waste is, you know, it's a little bit like, um, mm -hmm. you know, Mary Douglas says, you know, dirt is just, um, you know, it's just soil that's lost its connection to the ground. Waste is just, you know, something that's lost its, its framing or its definition of usefulness. And, and we put ideas, you know, to the side all the time. We make choices. We curate our way through our thinking before it even gets to the public. And I think that process, I don't know. It, I think it's just a, yeah, interesting. I hadn't really thought about it before, but your, your presentation has brought it up for me. Back in Cat Elder, you're back to you have a... Um... I was thinking, sorry, someone wrote oh, Louise or compost. I was also thinking about the compost. Yeah, um, exactly. Do you guys have um, any kind of method or process or way of thinking about the unrealized ideas and where they go or what happens with them? <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, so we're on my phone, so we might actually die again. <laughs> yeah. but one, uh, but, one good anyway. part of the internet is that you put stuff out there and people find it. So before Louise, um, we were talking right into this lexicon, which is just a bunch of um, scraps of writing that I think we all know is nutritional, mm -hmm. but don't know what to deal with. And so it was lovely to um, have someone find that on the internet. Say, what about this thing that is clearly an unfinished mm -hmm. set of scraps? So. Um, I think we try to just put as much out there as quickly as possible and see if anyone else finds something yeah. valuable. I think our process, all of our projects are kind of works in progress. We just throw a bunch of stuff at a wall and see what stays there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and because we're a group of three, it's also about and uh, coming and going. It's also about who has the energy to push something forward and to keep it going. And if there's an idea that we all realize, oh, this is a good one, you know, we're all energized to work on it. Although I, Here, so, I have to get my plug. Okay. Sometimes we'll have a project that we're all like, this is not good, but someone seems to see something uh, in it. And I think that may be another reason we're awkwardly placed in the arts because I think we're very responsive to like, different kinds of feedback. And I think, uh, yeah, so that's a big part of our process. Can I, sorry, I'll keep talking because no one else is. Can I, can I give you some feedback just very quickly? Yes, this, please. The smog tasting, for me, what it's about is um, you give people the opportunity to actually taste the air that they willingly walk through, that they willingly ride their bike through, that they willingly live their lives through, that they willingly uh, you know, in, in, inhabit all the time. But then when you offer them the opportunity to taste it, the, it, it suddenly has a very different cost. It has very different balance. It has a very different, there's a, a different level of commitment if you're going to uh, somehow ingest it by eating it as opposed to breathing it, as opposed to bringing it in the pores of your skin, somehow making it tangible does something that I think is very, very interesting. Um, yeah. The kind of funny part to that is that we've asked scientists about this um, kind of, or on a more like health level, what is the impact of eating the smog versus breathing it? And the scientists that we were working with said, um, I'd be more worried about my child eating that much sugar than that much smog because your digestive system is actually much better at dealing with these kind of pollutants than your respiratory system is. So that everybody always says, well, should we just make a giant smog meringue and eat all the pollution? <laughs> but it is an interesting thing to think about how we have these ideas about putting things in our body that maybe aren't even true to the health science around that hmm. oops sorry i think i broke up there huh yeah, no, no. okay um emma before we run out of time should we just i don't know if you got a chance to talk about the the next few uh, moments uh no uh oh you don't want the slides up okay 
um, but we have them here. So uh, I can oh, you look can at that. Read them. <laughs> <laughs> we can't share slides on our phone. <laughs> As, man, Sorry about this. We we'll, we just moved to Amsterdam. I guess our internet needs uh, an upgrade. Great. So um, yeah, uh, maybe you could just mention really quickly, and then uh, we can try to to share an image. the um, The next sort of lecture slash conversation will be about unexpected ingredients. Uh, oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here oh, she yes. has it. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and. Um, That'll be on February 4th and a little bit there, we're thinking about um, leading up to it, doing some writing and conversations about foregrounding taste as a means of knowing the world. Um, and um, do, 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 let me see, oh, here they are, perfect. And we have some early projects where we just ate stuff that we weren't supposed to. And I think the other thing that we'd like to revisit there is, um, the aspect of our work that kind of comes out of a feminist or, or Marxist critical science, uh, science technology studies. And so we've been doing some reading, um, revisiting Donna Haraway through the lens of Mackenzie Wark. And I think we'd like to do some deep reading of that and kind of think about how our relationship to the life sciences as maybe outsider and slightly now insider outsiders has changed and what we should do about that. And then, um, uh, the Air is Alive, which is the next one. Um, you know, we're kind of working on a big project right now about climate change, wildfires, and wheat. And um, one of the things we haven't been able to make room for yet is really looking at the, the symbolic meaning of wheat, especially in terms of conversations around civilizations, um, as well as settler colonial agriculture. And so I think that's something we want to dive into. Uh, there might be an experiment there that people could participate in, um, and that'll be that uh, moment will be in April, April first, and then finally um, frame shifts, which is kind of the last framework we're thinking through, is June of next year. And for that, I think we want to really revisit our ideas around scale, both um, planetary and microbial, and think about the vision tools or the seeing tools that come out of. Um, the natural sciences, but also the sort of politics of the planetary. And so as we start to do, as we continue to do work across domains and scales to kind of be more precise about where those ideas come from and, and how we can respond. I think we had a question from Camille. Um, could you maybe give us your definition of planetary indigestion as a way to conclude this talk? Uh, like most of our projects, we leak before we look. And we just needed a name for this thing. So we came up with planetary indigestion, um, not because we want to spend this year kind of, I think, writing a definition. So Camille, by the end of this, we'll have for sure the one sentence, the one paragraph and the one page uh, that's required <laughs> for, any, uh, for any new term, mm. but we don't have it yet. Mm. Yes. I think Camille's like, yeah, it's one on long enough. You guys got to go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Cool. Any thank last you so much. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to the Center for Genomic Astronomy, Emma, Zach, and Kat for joining us today. And thank you to all of you for being with us. Uh, I've put in the chat the schedule for the rest of the year and make sure you register for the next event, which will be on February 4th. And with that, thank you all and have a great weekend. Yeah, thanks so much.